one of the most misunderstood facets of God's character is that God is judge. God is your judge. Now, for some of us, that might be intimidating or kind of off-putting. We think of a robed individual that's stern and austere. Others of you may have conjured a comical image because you've watched too much Judge Judy. I don't know. But Daniel 5 is an invitation to persevere through the promise that God is your judge. We've seen the book of Daniel as an invitation to indeed persevere, to endure, to give ourselves to faithfulness by looking ahead to the promises of God. We've seen in the first four chapters that God has promised that he will have a kingdom that will last forever, that his kingdom and rule and reign in Jesus Christ will be the only kingdom. We've also seen that he has the power Over and over again, we've seen this. He has the power to make good on his promises. He delivers his servants from the fiery furnace. He drives kings mad, restores them all with just a word of his power. Daniel 5, though, focuses our hearts on the fact that God is going to bring about this empire, this rule and reign forever by standing as our judge. And the reason I want you to listen today is it's actually really good news that God is your judge. It's really good news that judgment rests with a holy, righteous God, because what God says about you is what's final and true. You know, our lives are composed of verdicts that we hear from other people, even from ourselves. Things we hear from the world, things we hear maybe from a coach or even a parent. It's easy to be kind of stitched together by the accusations and verdicts of others. But what Daniel 5 shows us is that what God says about us, his judgment about us, is the only thing that really matters. The story goes that Adam Sandler, when he was in acting school, was pulled aside by a professor who told him, you will never amount to anything as an actor. Quit, leave acting school and leave it behind. Now, if you know anything about the 90s, you guys know that that's my era, the world I grew up in. Adam Sandler was not an unsuccessful actor. That professor put himself in the position of judge and rendered a verdict in his life. Who are the people in your life that have rendered verdicts? What are the words that you hear when you consider your own life? Maybe there's some verdicts that have been rendered, accusations even about you that have been rendered by other people in your life. Daniel 5 calls us to see that regardless of what others have said about us, regardless of what we may even think about ourselves, God's judgment of us is all that matters. This passage starts, though, with us seeing the disrespect of the judge. First scene of this story, first 16 verses, focus on the disrespect shown to the judge of the world. We're introduced to this disrespect through a new character in Daniel named Belshazzar. Now, Belshazzar was co-regent. He was king alongside his father, and he and his father had conspired together to kill, that is to assassinate Nebuchadnezzar's rightful heir. Nebuchadnezzar is gone. Daniel 5 takes place probably 50 or 60 years later. Daniel's probably in his 70s at this point. And these two guys have usurped the throne. It's why, as you heard read a moment ago, he offers the third highest position because his father and himself, they ruled alongside one another. We also know historically that at this particular moment, the Babylonian army is in full retreat. The Persians have risen up, assembled an army and defeated them. And so they're on the run. They huddle in Babylon. And what does the king do amidst all this insanity and craziness? He throws a party. And not just any party. Look at what it says in verse one. King Belshazzar held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine in their presence. This is a glorified kegger, people. 
okay? The wine is flowing freely. They're acting a fool, even though the Persian army, history tells us, is literally marching towards their doors. And amidst the drunken stupor of the king, he does something very unwise. He pulls out what's described here as the vessels from the temple in Jerusalem and begins to drink from them, and not just drink from them, praising his gods by drinking those things. And the question is, why did he do this? Why did the king do this? Why did he pull these vessels out? A lot of debate amongst commentators. I think the reason he did is because he was trying to show his people the might and the power of the Babylonian army. He was saying, look at what we did in the past. Look at how we defeated these other nations. Here's the spoils of war, as it were. Look at what we've done. We can win again. This is a make Babylon great again kind of moment, if you know what I mean. He's trying to stir up morale amongst his people. But in so doing, he blasphemously disrespects the God of Israel. He uses elements that were meant for the worship of God, the true God, the living God, and he worships false gods. This disrespect, this blasphemous disrespect is a violation of the commandment God gave to Moses in Exodus 20 that we are to not take the name of the Lord our God in vain. That is, we're not to treat God with disrespect or to diminish him. That's exactly what Belshazzar is doing here. He is seeking to diminish God in order to elevate himself. He's seeking to exalt himself and belittle God. And the question Daniel 5 invites us to ask is, what's God gonna do? Here we go again. Daniel 3, what happened? King Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm not gonna let you go. Nobody could deliver you from my power. God comes through. Here we see again another pagan tyrannical, idolatrous king, challenging God, how is God going to respond? Look at verse five. At that moment, not a little bit later, not down the line, look at verse five. At that very moment, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and began writing on the plaster of the king's palace wall next to the lampstand. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, the writing on the wall? How many of you guys have ever heard that phrase? Daniel 5, 5 is where that comes from. Now, God could have just had writing appear miraculously on the wall, right? He could have just snapped his fingers and letters would have appeared. But instead, he has a hand, a disembodied hand appear. Specifically, we're told the fingers of a man hand appear. Now, if you pull on that thread of the finger of God, it pulls backwards and forwards. In the book of Exodus, Moses tells Pharaoh, let my people go, and the plagues begin, right? And in Exodus 8, the magicians of Pharaoh are going toe to toe with the God of Israel until they can't. And they look at Pharaoh, and do you remember what they say? This is the finger of God. This is not something humans can contrive. These plagues is the finger, Exodus 8, of God. You fast forward to the New Testament, Luke 11. Jesus is being accused of casting out demons by the power of a demon. And he says, you guys are nuts. But if I cast demons out by the finger of God, he says, the kingdom of God has come upon you. This hand represents the power and the presence of God. And lest we're wondering if that's how he interpreted it, notice how he responds. Look at verse, the rest of verse five. As the king watched the hand that was writing, his face turned pale. His thoughts so terrified him that he soiled himself and his knees knocked together. He literally lost control of his body. He was so afraid, so terrified that he lost control. You see, while the king has offered disrespect to God, while he sought to diminish God, he himself is the one who's been diminished. When you try to exalt yourself over God, all you end up doing is making yourself look like a fool. That's right. Psalm 2 even says that God 
laughs at those who oppose him. That's what we see happen right here. True to form, though, the king, like his predecessors before him, called the counselors together. He calls all his wise men, all his advisors. They huddle up. They look at the writing. Nobody can figure out what it really means. And it would be at this point you'd think, okay, he's got to find Daniel. Right? He needs to find Daniel. Daniel is somebody who previously was known to be able to interpret these things. But notice, the way the text reads is that he doesn't know who Daniel is. Now, some might say, well, he may not have known who Daniel was just because the Babylonian empire was so vast. Maybe their paths never crossed. I think there's actually textual evidence for a different conclusion. I think the reason he didn't know who Daniel was is because he had dismissed and distanced himself from all of what Nebuchadnezzar had accomplished. Belshazzar was a person we know from history who was incredibly vain and contemptuous of everyone around him that challenged him. And there was this kind of pushing back of anything that reminded him of his predecessor's success. And so it was very possible that when these men came into power, Daniel was marginalized and pushed aside. But a new character shows up to alert him to his presence. The queen mother is probably best how we understand verse 10, comes and tells him, hey, Daniel can deliver. Please notice, as we heard read a moment ago, she doesn't call him Belteshazzar. Did you notice that? What does she call him? She calls him Daniel because Daniel was his real name that symbolized his allegiance to his God. He says, this guy can deliver. And this is the point, okay, you think now the king is going to humble himself. He's going to listen. He's going to respond. He's gonna bow the knee to the true God. But notice how contemptuously, disrespectfully, he responds to Daniel in verse 13. Look at verse 13. Then Daniel was brought before the king. The king said to him, are you Daniel, one of the Judean exiles that my predecessor, the king, brought from Judah? He doesn't call him Daniel, wise and understanding. He doesn't call him Daniel, the one who solved mysteries and riddles in the past. He calls him to remember his defeat. This is a backhanded way of addressing somebody. This is a disrespectful, contemptuous way of responding. And it shows up, as we'll see in a few moments, in how Daniel responds to him. But he responds not with humility, not with asking for God to help him. He responds with further disrespect and contempt, not just for Daniel's God, but for Daniel himself. Offers him money to interpret the dream, the, the, excuse me, the writing, and that's how the first scene ends. What we see then as you watch Belshazzar's response is disrespect, blasphemous disrespect of God, fear, but then he's hardened again into contempt and disrespect for God and his people. The point is what sin does is it blinds us, it hardens us to the truth. If I were to give it to you in a principle, here it is. We'll put it on the screen. Opposition to God blinds us of our need for God. What the first scene of Daniel shows us is that Belshazzar's sinful, rebellious opposition to God blinded him from the very one who could help him. In my estimation, this is one of the most disastrous effects of sin in the lives of human beings. That it doesn't just leave us opposed to God. It doesn't just leave us in rebellion against God. It leaves us blind to the very one who can help us. Amen. I don't know if you've ever seen those really sad commercials about animals or dogs that have been abused. A few years ago, I was watching one where there were people trying to come and rescue these animals. If you've ever watched one of those videos, you know that these animals, all they've ever known from humans is abuse and harm. And so when another human approaches, they're snarling and they're angry. And as this group of rescuers came to this dog, it snapped at him and snarled at him and growled with its teeth shown to say, get away from me. And as I watched that video, I thought about what sin does to us because that's exactly the picture. All of us enter this world snarling and snapping at the very one who can save us. 
Those rescuers were trying to help that dog. They were trying to get him out of the mess that he was in. But all he could see because of what had been done to him was a threat. What this means as we apply this to our lives, church, if you're a Christian, when you're sharing the gospel with people, don't be surprised if there's kind of an opposition and even a suspicion and cynicism about God in people's lives. Don't be surprised if the first time you share the gospel with somebody, maybe they reject it because the very sickness that they have in their hearts that is sin blinds them from the truth. What I think is needed today in 2024 more than ever is patient perseverance and our sharing of the gospel with the lost. There may be people you encounter where you share the gospel with them and the very first time, man, they come to Christ and it's amazing. But don't be surprised if it takes time. You have to share the gospel with them multiple times. Who are the people in your life you need to be more patient with in your sharing of the gospel? Who are the people in your life you need to be more patient with in your sharing of the gospel? If indeed sin blinds us to the solution that is the grace of God, let's be patient and long-suffering in how we share the good news of Christ with other people. This passage, though, moves not just from the disrespect of the judge to the response from the judge. This passage moves from seeing God disrespected, diminished, the transformation that Belshazzar goes to as he's afraid, to us seeing how God responds to this challenge. As I alluded to a moment ago, Daniel responds basically with uh, shove it to the money. He says, keep, keep your money. I want nothing to do with being paid to serve God. I'm gonna do this because I believe God's called me to do this. And Daniel puts on the mantle of a prophet. And before he answers the the king's question, he preaches a sermon. Did you see this? He preaches a sermon. Listen to the sermon Daniel preaches to Belshazzar in verse 18. Your majesty, the most high God gave sovereignty, greatness, glory, and majesty to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, because of the greatness he gave them, all peoples, nations, and language were terrified and fearful of him. He killed anyone he wanted and kept alive anyone he wanted. He exalted anyone he wanted and humbled anyone he wanted. But when his heart was exalted and his spirit became arrogant, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. Daniel exalts God as the source of Babylon's power. You guys don't have power because You got it on your own. You have it because God gave you power. It's similar to what, remember when Jesus is before Pilate? What did he say to Pilate? You would have no authority over me if God had not given it to you. That's what's happening in Daniel chapter five. He exalts God's authority. He says, look, God looked at Nebuchadnezzar and said that he had so exalted, so pridefully lifted himself up that it was time for him to be humbled. And he talks about the, Chapter four events we read about last week that God drove Nebuchadnezzar insane. But he also exalts God's grace. Look at how it ended in verse 21. Until he acknowledged that the most high God is ruler over human kingdoms and sets anyone he wants over them. Remember the lesson from last week. God did not drive Nebuchadnezzar insane to harm him. He drove him insane to humble him to show him the truth. That's the grace and the goodness of God. When we experience the discipline and correction of God, it is always for our good. What Daniel is doing is he's addressing the root issue in Belshazzar's life. See, before he gets to the writing on the wall and talking about Belshazzar himself, he's addressing the heart of the king. And that is that he's disrespected the living and the true God. In most of our lives, when we deal with sin and unfaithfulness in our lives, it's because we've misunderstood who God is. For most of us, when we sin, it's because our God is too small. 
what Belshazzar's doing, what excuse me, Daniel's doing in the life of Belshazzar is he's trying to broaden his horizon to who God is, to the bigness and the greatness of God. He's saying the reason you did what you did is because you don't understand who God is. The same is true for you and I. The reason we do what we do when we sin is because we don't know who God is. The reason I give my affection and my worship to other things is because I'm missing out on the beauty and the majesty of who God is. Now, A.W. Tozer said, what's most important about you is what you think about when you think about God. What's most important about you, Tozer said, is what you think about when you think about God. What comes to your mind when you hear the word God is the most important thing about you. Because if your God is small, the things you're running after are gonna seem attractive. If your God is small and ineffective, the problems of your world are gonna seem so much bigger than they actually are. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Belshazzar is confronted with God who God is, because that's the root of the problem. But this leads to a warning. We see Daniel exalt God, but we see him warn Belshazzar as well. Look at verse 22 to see this warning. But you, his successor, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. The events of Daniel 4, if you remember, many of them were told in the first person. You remember that? Much of Daniel 4 is actually told from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective because it's a letter he wrote to his people. That letter was so widely distributed about his insanity and restoration, but it was so widely known that Daniel here says, Belshazzar, you knew that God humbled Nebuchadnezzar. You knew that he'd come to believe that God was the true power in the world. And yet, Not only did you not humble your heart, verse 23, look at it, the text. Instead, you have exalted yourself against the Lord of the heavens. See, there isn't any middle ground with God. You are either humbling your heart before him or you're being hardened in your rebellion against him. You are either humbling your heart before God or you're hardening your heart in rebellion against him against him. Daniel says, Belshazzar, the reason you drank from these vessels, the reason you sought to use God to stir up morale amongst your troops, the reason you've diminished God and been diminished yourself is because rather than being humbled, you were hardened. What's the result? The result is a verdict. And you see it there in verse 25. Daniel interprets the writing. He says, this is what was inscribed, mene, mene, tekel, and parson, This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, that God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel means that you've been weighed on the balance and found deficient. Perez means that your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. These three words are Aramaic words. They have an Aramaic root. They speak to God evaluating or valuing Babylon and specifically Belshazzar. We see first God shows us his power in that he's numbered their days. The Babylonian kingdom has come to an end because God powerfully has said so. We see secondly, God's law being exalted. His law, he says, you've been weighed and found deficient. God has evaluated Belshazzar against his law. He's taken God's name in vain. He's acted as if God doesn't exist and he's unimportant. He's been found wanting and waiting in the, result, in the balance. But finally, we also see an elevation of God's plan. There's his power in the first word. There's his law in the second, but there's his plan. Verse 28, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now, don't miss this. This is Daniel 2 being fulfilled right here. You remember Daniel 2? The dream the king had. Remember what it was? Gold, silver, bronze, and iron. God is saying it's time for that head of gold to be replaced by that next kingdom and empire that's coming. He interprets this. The king doesn't humble himself, doesn't praise God, does make good on what he promised and gives Daniel position and power. 
but see how it's fulfilled in verse 30. That very night, similar to what you read in verse five, at that moment, that very night, Belshazzar, the king of Chaldeans, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom at the age of 62. The Persian army that was literally at their doorsteps breaks through, kills the king, and establishes Persian rule and reign. But what we're meant to see is this is not the Persians just beating the Babylonians. This is God's sovereign plan. God has brought this about. God has exercised judgment on Babylon and on this king. And this moment in biblical history foreshadows the end of all things when God will bring judgment on the world. You can draw a straight line from Daniel 5, 30 and 31 to the book of Revelation 19 where Jesus appears on a white horse with a sword from his mouth, destroys evil once and for all and establishes his rule and reign on this earth. What you're seeing, brothers and sisters, is not just God's vengeance, not just his anger. You're seeing his justice and righteousness. One of my favorite movies in the world is the movie Tombstone. How many of you guys have seen Tombstone in here? Western, White Earp, Doc Holliday, taking on this gang of murderous outlaws who at one point kill one of Wyatt's brothers and maim another. In a critical point in the movie, Wyatt is beginning to go after these guys and they're taking them out. One of their fellow party posse members says, you know, if it were my brothers, I would want revenge too. And Doc Holliday says, It's not revenge he's after, it's a reckoning. Revenge is just about getting somebody back for what they did to you. A reckoning is setting things that were wrong right. It's setting things in order. It's establishing not just error, showing that error had happened. It's establishing justice and truth. What you're seeing God do is not just get revenge on the Babylonians. He's not just punishing Belshazzar. It's a reckoning God is bringing to bear at this moment in biblical history. Brothers and sisters, what we are longing for, what we cannot wait to see happen is the reckoning of all things in the end when King Jesus comes back. The truth of Daniel 5 in his statement is this. The Lord is is the judge who reckons all. What Daniel 5 teaches us is that God is the judge who reckons, who sorts out all things. And Christian, what I want you to hear today is that's good news for you. God's judgment, his reckoning of all things, if you are in Christ, it's incredibly good news. God's true, final, righteous judgment is good for you. In Christ Jesus, what God says about you is true. That you are forgiven, loved, and redeemed by the God of the universe. What God says about you is final, Christian. No one can come and overturn what God has rendered over your life. The declaration of righteousness, won for you by Jesus Christ, no one can overturn that. But it's also righteous. It's true, it's final, but it's righteous. God's judgment of you wasn't just because he snapped his finger or ignored your sin. God's judgment of righteousness over you is based on the fact that Jesus Christ, Jesus took your sin on himself and bore the wrath, bore the judgment of God so that you and I could by faith be given his forgiveness and grace. The righteous, just, final, true judgment of God, Christian, is such good news this morning. Some of you this morning may be discouraged. Maybe you're dealing with Circumstances that are just incredibly challenging. I was talking to some people before the service that are dealing with 
physical pain and trying circumstances in their family. One of the quiet verdicts that's often whispered to our hearts when we go through discouraging moments is that it'll always be this way. You'll never get out of that. Can I just remind you that that's not true? The judgment of God says if you are discouraged, if you're despondent this morning, allow God to lift your head, to look ahead to the promise that one day all of the discouragement, all of the pain and sorrow you go through right now will one day be gone forever. Amen. There may be others of you that are struggling with anxiety. I deal with a lot of people over the years that have struggled with anxiety, and especially younger Christians that just are overwhelmed by the pressure and the weight of the world. One of the lies the enemy tries to whisper to your heart, one of the verdicts that they try to whisper is that you can't hang you're not strong enough, you're not smart enough to do the things that are in front of you. Can I just remind you that in Jesus Christ, you can joyfully agree with that? I can't do this. I think we, we get anxious when we fight the enemy's battle on their terms. Don't agree with the terms of the battle, change it. No, no, I can't do this. But by God's grace, what he's called me to, he will give me the grace to carry this burden that's before me. If you struggle with anxiety, believe that the judgment of God means that you need his grace and mercy every single day. There'll be others of you that are struggling with people pleasing. We should start a people pleasing anonymous group here, okay? A lot of people pleasers are running around. And the lie that's told to people pleasers is you won't be loved unless everybody likes you. Nobody's gonna really love you unless you can just get everybody to think you're great. And if one person doesn't like you or somebody has a problem with you, everything's wrong. Remember, Christian, the judgment of God. You're to live your life not based on what you can achieve, but what you've received in Christ. Amen. I was reading a book yesterday by a guy named Jared Wilson, who's an author. And he was writing about going and preaching at a church at a very impoverished city. And in the back wall of this church building, it said, all the charges against me have been dropped. And they wrote that on the wall to especially communicate the gospel to many of these people who had been incarcerated, who'd been in prison, but God had done a work in their lives and they'd been redeemed and restored. And they put on the wall this declaration, all the charges against me in Christ have been dropped. The good news of Daniel 5, Christian, is that all the charges against you have been dropped because the righteous judge of the universe has laid your penalty and punishment on Jesus Christ. Live your life with the good news that God is your judge. But as I close, I do want to say a word to those of you that are not Christians because while Daniel 5 tells us that it's good news that God is judged to those of us that are in Christ, if you do not know Christ, the fact that God is judge is horrible news. You see, Daniel, you can understand it if you lay aside chapters four and five together. They're the story of two kings. Both Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar receive miraculous intervention from God, but they respond very differently. One responds in humility, chapter four. He falls before God saying, I need you. Another responds in blasphemous disrespect and rejects God. And it's as if Daniel, these two chapters, are held out to us to ask a simple question. Which king are you? Are you responding in your life to God in humility and desperation for him? Or are you responding to God in prideful resistance and rebellion before him? If you're here today and you're not a Christian, what we hold out to you is the good news that Jesus Christ died for you, that he died for your sins, that he rose from the dead, that you could bow your knee to King Jesus and receive his mercy, forgiveness, and love. If you're here today and you've never crossed the line of faith, You've never turned from your sin and trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. As soon as this service is over, this back area, our next step corner, we'll have pastors, elders, and leaders there that would love to pray with you, talk with you, and help you understand what it means to become a follower of Jesus. The judgment of God is such good news to those of us that are in Christ. But if you're not in Christ Jesus, 
Let this serve as a warning to you today to turn from your sin and trust him. Would you pray with me, please? God, we're thankful. (laughs) So thankful that this morning, as we've lifted our voices, as we've prayed, as we've been reminded of who you are, God, that you are our judge and that your judgment of us in Christ Jesus is forgiven, redeemed, and loved. Oh God, I pray for the Christians in this room this morning. God, I pray for the brothers and sisters in Christ who know you today, that God, you lift their head, that all the charges against them have been dropped. And because that's true, everything's changed. God, would you let the beauty and the truth of Jesus Christ penetrate the deepest recesses of our hearts. God, would you freshly affect us day after day with the depth of your love for us. Finally, Lord, I pray for anyone here today that doesn't know you. The same truth that humbled Nebuchadnezzar hardened Belshazzar. God, I pray that by your spirit, you would soften the hearts of those that don't know you, that you'd open the eyes of the blind. They would turn from their sin and trust you and you alone. We give you this time of response, God, as we lift our voices and sing in a moment. Would you continue to bring your word to bear in our hearts and our minds? In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen.